And this morning, we're starting a brand new sermon series in the book of Ruth. Now, if you've never read the book of Ruth, it's one of my favorites because the book of Ruth is a love story, right? And it's not my favorites because it's a love story. I am a softy, but, but that's not why I really love the book of Ruth. I love the book of Ruth because it's really a story of all of us, of complete brokenness and then redemption, of separation and then a restoration, right? So I love the book of Ruth because this is, this is all of our story when it comes to reconciling our relationship through Jesus Christ. And so this is really a tragedy, but it also fills us with hope. And so we get to kind of see through the life of a few women what God's redemptive story really kind of looks like and what it means for all of us. And so to be honest, I don't like starting new sermon series. And there's a reason. It's because you can't just dive into one piece of truth and unpack it for everybody. You got to kind of set up the entire thing. Does that make sense? You got to talk about where you're going. You can't just like nerd out on one little piece. And so I don't really like that. But, but this morning, we're going to set up the entire book of Ruth so that you understand what's going on. Maybe you've never read it before. Maybe you've read it before and never seen a few things. But I want to make sure that we're all moving forward with a fundamental understanding of what's going on in this book, okay? So if you want to do that, you can go turn, it, turn to the book of Ruth. We're going to be in there this morning. It's in the first quarter of your Bible. Um, it's in the Old Testament. And the book of Ruth starts by saying this. In the days when the judges ruled Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and his two sons with him. So the period of the judges is about 1200 to 1000 BC, about a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. And if you want to learn more about what was going on during the time of the judges, you can actually read the book of Judges, right? You could read what was going on there, but little synopsis, it's one of the darkest, most perverse, most wicked times in the history of Israel. It's, it's absolutely off the chain. And, and what's happening there sums up in one line. It says, the people were doing what was right in their own eyes. And so, so this is what's happening. This is the backdrop for the book of Ruth. And these people, the people of Israel, they're surrounded by people who are not following their God. They are surrounded on all sides by people who do not follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God we call Yahweh in the Old Testament. And so instead of being countercultural, instead of standing out and saying, this is what it looks like to serve the one true God, they just kind of start blending in. And from one generation to another, they stop talking about the greatness of their God, and they become more and more like the culture they live in. Does that sound familiar at all? I'm just throwing that out there. And as a result, God's people drift. They drift from him. They drift far away from him. They're no longer really serving him. Yes, the temple is there. Yes, the people are there. But God's presence isn't really sought out by his people. So during the time of Judges, the book of Ruth zeroes in. And it doesn't zero in on Israel. It zeroes in on one family. It goes all the way in, down to one family. And, and this husband, his wife, and their two children, they find themselves in a time of famine. And there's a decision to make for the dad. Sorry. There's a decision to make for the dad. Because people are literally starving to death. People are literally losing their lives because there's not enough. But 50 miles away in Moab, there's plenty. There's a lot going on, right? That's like us to Roanoke, right? It's not that far away. Like 50 miles away, things are going really good. And so we've got to kind of ask ourselves, I'm going to just go to... Check one, two. There we go. So, so we got to kind of ask ourselves this question. What's going on? Did God cause the famine in Israel because they're not following him? Are, is God the one that caused this? It kind of seems so because not too far down the road in a country not blessed and not called God's own, there seems to be plenty, right? And so this, this guy, he has a decision to make. Do I go where there's plenty to a land of people that do not serve my God? Or do I, do I stay in the land given to me by my God and, and just hope for the best, right? 
these people that didn't worship the God of his ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Listen, if they went to Moab, they would definitely be the only Jewish family in the neighborhood. Does that make sense? There would be no one else. Listen, there's not a temple to Yahweh. There's not a Jewish group in Moab. Listen, because good Jews don't move to Moab. It's filled of, of full of just unscrupulous people, people they don't want to be around, people that are serving themselves instead of the God of their forefathers. And so this is not a place a good Jewish man would ever move his family, but he's desperate. And he makes the decision and he leaves it all behind. He leaves his friends, his family, his faith all behind. And he moves to Moab in the hope that there will be plenty and that his family will find life. The story continues. We find out the names of these people in the family. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Mahalon and Kilian. The, name's Elimelech, the name Elimelech means, my God is my king, which is kind of ironic because he just left the king in the, year, the rear view, right? Like, God is my king, kind of, as long as it's convenient, right? And then Naomi means sweet, means pleasant. Another way to say it is sweetheart. She sounds like a keeper, right? So, you, so you've got God is my king and sweetheart. Now, I don't want to be the judgy guy that says you named your kids what? Because I have a son named Zealand, right? So, like, I'm not, I'm not going to go on a limb and say, I can't believe you named your son this. But they named their kids Mahalon and Killian, which literally means sick and dying. That's what it means. I, I'm not saying they're unfit parents. I'm just saying, like, what are they thinking, right? Like, how does that, like, could you imagine, this is my son's swine flu and COVID. Like, can you imagine? Like, that's, that's, kind, of, that's kind of the indication here. Like, like, who would name their kids this thing, right? And so mom, dad, swine flu, and COVID, they move from Bethlehem to Moab, and they start building a life there. And by doing this, listen, they would have had physical food, but they would have been spiritually starving. They would not have had anything that resembled their God in their area. Because none of the people in, the Moab, in Moab would, would have served or would have worshipped the God of Israel. And we know this because later we find out these young men, they grow up and they take Moabite wives. Why? Because there's no Jewish women around for them to marry. Right? So they're going to make the best of a bad situation. They're going to marry a Moabite woman. Is God mad that they married a Moabite woman? No. But culturally at the time, this is not done by good Jewish people. Does that make sense? This is, this is not acceptable in the eyes of good Jewish folks. But their options were limited, so they married women with different gods all together. Moving on. This family, they moved to Moab looking for plenty, hoping to find life. But the Bible tells us in verse 3, then Elimelech, what? He died. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. Why did Elimelech move to Moab? to find life, to, to save his life, right? What happens? He goes to Moab away from everything he knows, away from his God, and he dies. Moral of the story, we think we can control the outcomes. But we need to understand more and more and more that it's always in God's hands. It doesn't matter how much we think this is going to save us. Listen, if we are not in the will of God, it does not matter. It is in his hands. But one of the things that bothers me is we don't know how he died. We don't know if he had a heart attack, if it was old age. We, we don't know, right? We have no idea. And I hate things in my life when I don't have the answer. How about you guys? You guys ever struggle when something happens and you're like, God, I just want to know why? Like, I'm, I, I am mad, but beyond that, like, just explain to me why I had to suffer, go through that, why I had to walk through that. Like, if you just told me why, I'd be, I'd be okay, right? And God doesn't answer. God knows right? Have you ever noticed God gives us the information we need, but he never gives us all the information we want? Have you ever, have you ever noticed that? And it's so frustrating sometimes because we've got, we're like, God, just give me it all. Just let me see the whole picture. Would you just listen for once and just do it my way? Because everything would just work out so much better, right? But life goes on. We have questions that are unanswered. And we see that Naomi and her two, is left with her two sons. And in that culture, when the husband died and you had sons. It was the son's job to then take care of the mother until she died, right? So Naomi would have been sad, but she would have been cared for. Naomi would have been devastated, but she would have had security still. Does that make sense? Everything is still not terrible, but, but it's bad, right? 
But we find out in verse 4 that swine flu and COVID, they actually find girls that don't mind their names, right? One married a girl named Orpah, not Oprah, that's a different girl, right? And the other girl is named Ruth. But unfortunately, we find the story gets even sadder in verse 4. The two sons marry Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, the other named a woman named Ruth. But about 10 years later, both Mahalon and Killian die. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. Why did Elimelech move to Moab? To save the life of his family, right? What happens? His family, one by one, is dying away from their God in Moab. What he thought was going to bring security didn't. Again, we can't outrun destiny, right? We can't outrun what God is up to. We can try to create safety and security, but listen, that's up to God to provide, not up to us. So she is now left alone. There's three women who are left with no means to care for themselves. At this time in history, women didn't work. It was the man's job to care for the women. So these women are left with nothing. Women can't own property at this time. Okay? They're left with nothing. They have nothing left. They're absolutely devastated. This is a picture of devastation today. This is a picture of total hopelessness in the time of Ruth. There's no hope to be had. They have absolutely nothing. They have no means to care for themselves or one another. Listen, maybe I have issues sometimes. How many of you guys have issues sometimes? How many of you guys love the fact that the Bible has issues with the people that are in it? Like, we don't see it. Every time, it's not like, oh, look how wonderful it was the entire time. Like, I love that people in the Bible deal with real issues, just like you and just like me, and that they have questions and that they struggle just like you and just like me. I love that I can commiserate with the people in the Bible. See, because we can understand on some level the loss that they must have felt. They felt alone. They felt isolated confused, like, what, what's going on? What am I going to do next? Have you ever been in one of those times in your life where you look around and you kind of wonder, how on earth did I get here? Like, like, what happened? Like, what have I done so wrong to deserve all of this? Like, have you ever been there before? Anybody besides me? Like, okay, you're all holier than I am. That's okay. It's okay. But like, but I've been there where I'm like, what in the world is going on? Like, what else do I have to do, Lord? Like, could you just tell me what the plan is? Tell me how the story ends. Just give me some hope. So these women are absolutely devastated, but we get to see how Naomi responds. She's the matriarch, the leader of the family now. She hears some good news in verse 6. Naomi hears that in Moab, the Lord has blessed the people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. With her two daughters-in-law, she set out to the place, from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead back to Judah. The place they left that was full of death, the place that they left that had no hope for them, that just a few years before was, was not the place they wanted to be, is now the place they're going back to. God is providing for his people. The place that they've fed, fled to, to to find hope and, and plenty in the time of famine had resulted in nothing but death. So they get ready to head home, and they pack up, and they, they head to Judah, and so Naomi says, let's go. Let's go where God's blessing. Let's go at least where, where I know some people. Let's go where God and his people are. So they start heading back, and along the way, sweet Naomi musters up the strength and the courage to have a hard conversation with her daughters. And she says this, go back to your mother's homes. And may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. And she kissed them goodbye. And they all broke down and wept. She said, girls, you've been good to me. You've been good to my family. You were good to my boys. But you have a lot of life left. You have a lot of life left to live. Go back home. You have hope for a future there. You can, listen, find another boy. Settle down. Start a new family. Start over. You've got time. There's no hope if you go with me. I'm just going to drag you down. And she plays, prays that blessing over them. Just go and, and be blessed and, and, and be fruitful and multiply. And they all started to cry. Why? Because they truly love each other. 
She sees them as her daughters. If you have a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law, you've been a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law, or you have an adopted kid, listen, you know what it feels like to feel like you are loved, like you are one of theirs, right? And that's the same thing that's happening here. Is that these, she sees them as her daughters. But the girls aren't having it, and they respond, we see in verse 10. They say, no, we want to go with you to your people. They said, listen, we're going with you. We're going with you to Bethlehem. You are all we've got left. We're not leaving you. We are committed to you. We're family, and we're going to figure this thing out. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who can grow up and be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I'm too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to remarry? right? I love that she says, listen, girls, look, listen, I'm too old. And even if I wasn't, are you going to wait around till I raise someone who's old enough to marry you? Like, are you really going to wait that long? You owe me nothing else. I want you to go back home. Go back to what you know. Go back to your God. Go back to your family. Go back to where you have a future because there is no future with me. She loves them, but she tells them over and over, go home. Go back home. Go back to your mom and dad. Get your life back together. Meet a nice boy. Start over. In verse 14, and again they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. Orpah caves. She's like, you're right. There is no hope. There's no reason I should be going with you. Not because she doesn't love her, but she said, there is something. I can go back. There is hope for me elsewhere. And so she heads back to her gods and to her family to start over. But Ruth isn't having it. And in verse 16, we actually hear the first words spoken by Ruth. And they're absolutely powerful. Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. I don't know about you. I need some friends like Ruth. You guys know what I'm saying? I need those. We all have those people that when the chips are down, you need to make a phone call. They're going to be there. That's Ruth. We need more people. And listen, that's not just our friends. That's what church is supposed to be like, right? When the chips are down, when things go sideways, we're supposed to be able to say, hey, I need you. And we rally around like family. See, Ruth found connection and she was never going to lose it. It didn't matter where Naomi ended up going. She said, I'm going with you. I'm not going to lose this connection because this connection is vital, it's important, and I'm not going to let it go. What we need to realize is this is a pretty big step for Ruth. She's not, she's not Jewish. She's going into a foreign land as a, as a hostile occupant, right? She's not going to be welcomed. She's not going to be like, oh, you're, you're Naomi's daughter-in-law. Yeah, come on in. No, she is, she is an enemy to the Jewish people. She is not welcome. And listen, I want us to understand something completely. She is going with Naomi, and God has not said a word to her. Nowhere do we see God say, hey, stick with Naomi. Ruth is just so committed that she is unwilling to leave her. And she said, listen, I'm so willing that your God's going to become my God. I am so willing to follow you. I will do whatever it takes to be with you. She's walking into the unknown. And we see these stories in the Bible where God says, do this, right? And people either do it or they don't do it. We go, wow, they had so much faith. Or we go, wow, they had no faith at all. Ruth is walking into this completely blind. She has no promise of a future. She has no promise of hope. She is just committed to her family and Naomi. She's saying, in essence, if this God is good enough for you, then he's good enough for me. Faith, that, folks, that's what faith in action looks like, right? It's stepping out when we don't have any inkling, any answer, any, any sort of insight into what the next page brings. And this is Ruth. She's just stepping out. She's just walking out. She's looking at, seeing what God has potentially for her. And she's saying, listen, I have no idea what the outcome is going to be. I have no idea what's in the future for us. But if this God is good for you, and if you're there, then I'm going to be there too. I'm challenged by Ruth's faith. Because listen, I don't know about you, I like knowing the answers, right? 
I like knowing what the next step's going to look like. I, I, I'm a kind of a big, dumb animal. I need like those burning bush moments. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like I need God to make it clear, clear, clear. Because I'm stubborn. He can, like, moving to Virginia from California, listen, it took an act of God, literally, because I kept saying, I don't think so, I don't think so, I don't think so, until it was so evident that it's what I'm supposed to do, that if I didn't do it, I'd just be walking in complete and total, like, like rebellion. Does that make sense? Like, I, that's the kind of leading I need. Like, I'm just like, no, I'm not sure that's right. I'm not sure that's right. I'm not sure that's right. This is me. But Ruth has none of that. I'm challenged by this kind of faith. I'm challenged by people who just step out and say, God, you go before me. I'm challenged by people who say, hey, listen, if your God's good enough for you, it's good enough for me, and I believe he's going to make this all right. That's insane faith that I wish I had an ounce of. So we continue to see in verse 18 that Naomi keeps trying to convince Ruth to leave, and Ruth isn't having it. And they find their way to Bethlehem, and we don't know how long it took them. We don't know if they said another word. The story kind of goes dark. But we do know they make it to Bethlehem, and the town is a buzz. Everybody is talking about the fact that Naomi has showed up to town, right? Social media is blowing up. Have you heard? Have you heard? Have you heard? And these two women, they come up. They see Naomi, and they, go, they come up to her, and these two women, they say this. They say, is it really Naomi? The women ask. Naomi says, don't call me Naomi. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? She said, stop calling me Naomi, which means what? Sweet, pleasant, sweetheart. Stop calling me sweet and pleasant. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter. Stop calling me sweet and pleasant. You can now call me bitter, right? Don't call me sweetheart. Instead, call me bitter old hag. That's who I am now. And that's who you've got. That's who is in front of you. How many of you guys have ever heard, hung out with someone who's, you know, bitter? Like, they're a lot of fun, right? Aren't they? Like, they barrel last. Like, there's so much fun to be with. They have such a rosy outlook on everything. She's like, no, no, you don't call me sweet. You call me bitter because God has taken everything from me. I'm angry at him. Listen, the, the word is Jesus. The Almighty did this to me. Not, not us, not some unfortunate circumstances. God did this to me. I went away full. But the Lord has brought me home empty. She's saying, God ruined my life. God ruined my life. Don't call me pleasant, call me bitter. I don't know about you, but I don't think I need a friend that bad, right? Like for, for Ruth to say, I'm going to stay with you, bitter old lady. I'm going to stay with you to the end of the earth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make your God my God. I don't need a friend that bad. I can find someone that's happier and easier to get along with. But Ruth says, I'm committed to you. She says, don't call me sweet. I'm not pleasant. And I think people often in the church, we look at people in society and who are kind of like Naomi and and we mean well, but we say stuff that's nonsensical. Like, God's got a plan. You know, they're in a better place now. You know, just put your faith in Jesus. And those are great platitudes on greeting cards, but they have no place in the conversation of a believer to another person. Because they mean nothing. These people are broken. They're hurting. And you're saying, oh, but God's got a plan. Great. Maybe he could tell me what that plan is. Because I'm broken. I'm hurting. I'm bitter. And he has done this to me. I'm not pleasant. Listen, we always think that people's faith is misplaced because they're bitter. Who does Naomi blame? God. Her faith is not misplaced. She knows exactly who she's blaming. And I can commiserate with Naomi because, listen, when I first came to faith, I lived a life of a lot of loss. A lot of loss. A lot of people close to me, my father dying. And I was angry. And I blamed God. And all I wanted was answers. I wanted to know why. I just wanted to know why I had to go through all of that to get to where I'm at. And so now that I have faith and now that I believe who you are, you and I are going to have some words. Because I don't get it. And I don't understand. But you know what I didn't get? See, sometimes we look at the chapters of our life that we've lived and we think that's the whole story. 
Sometimes we look at the hardship we've gone through and we go, God, why? Why did you let my story be that? And God's like, there's a lot more story left. If you would just look differently, if you would think differently, if you lift up your head, if you just look forward, what you would see is not your life full of this, but there's so much more. Listen, it doesn't matter how amazing your faith is. We've all come to this crisis at some point in our life where we're just not happy with God because he doesn't do what he's told. Maybe I'm the only one. He never consults us. He does whatever he wants, and it sounds like I'm bitter, but I'm not, because this is what I've learned. The goodness of God is on the next page. And his faithfulness to do more and greater things is coming. But sometimes I get so focused on what's happened, I get so stuck on what's happened to me that I cannot see what he's doing for me. And listen, this is the story of all of us. Sometimes we get so stuck looking backwards that we cannot see the blessings that are coming. And that's something we all need to struggle with. Listen, if you are stuck looking back, you will never move forward. That's just the truth. If you are stuck looking at the hurts of your past, that's all you're ever going to see. But that's not the end of the story. And some of you are like, but listen, man, I've I've had a lot of chapters. I don't have many left. Listen, those ones that you have left can be the best chapters of your entire life. But sometimes we're so focused on the loss, we're so focused on the hurt, we're so focused on what's happened that we miss what God is up to. Listen, I think there are a lot of people who are just like Naomi. They're angry at God. They blame him for things that have gone wrong. Who want answers, but they haven't got any. See, I think there are a lot of people in church that are just like Naomi. They're just not as honest as she is. They come to church and you say, how are you doing? They say, we're blessed. We're doing good. God's on the throne but they're angry and they're hurting. Why? Because we don't create, listen church, we don't create avenues for them to have honest dialogue and say, I'm angry at God for what he's allowed me to go through. And instead, when we do hear things like that, we try to fill the void with the platitudes and say, well, God's got a plan. You know, they have hope. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11, which is used out of context, but that's a different sermon, right? God wants to do something in and through us, but it takes us being okay with the tension of people being angry, of people being hurt. If you know the story of Naomi, listen, you know it's not done yet. But man, what she has lived through so far is so devastating. There's a lot of people in church, maybe not this church, but capital C church, that need the freedom to struggle in their frustration and their anger with God. But sometimes in church, we we make everything so sickeningly sweet that we never give people the place to actually process the fact that they're frustrated, they're angry, they don't understand that they've lost hope. Can I just say this morning, what you've gone through what the people that you know are angry have gone through, what Naomi has gone through is not the end of the story. That God has more in store. Listen, if we're only focused on what's happened, we'll never be able to see what's coming. The end of chapter one ends in verse 22, and it says this, so Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest. You guys know what the barley harvest represents? It's hope. Because when she left, there was nothing but famine. There was nothing for her there. There was only death. But she's coming back to plenty. She's coming back and she's able to see for the very first time there is hope. See, sometimes we have to stop mourning our past to really press into what God has for our future. There can be a lot of chapters left in our story. It doesn't erase the bad chapters. And it doesn't make the hurt that you went through go away. But God, in his grace, and in his glory, and in his goodness, 
who loves you and I won't leave us there. We have a choice, church. We have a choice. See, too often we wait for God to change things. We've got to start being that change. Look for good. Celebrate. Glorify God for the things that have come. Look ahead and see what harvest awaits because it's hope. And sometimes we just lose it all. Can you stand with me so we can pray? Jesus, would you, would you remind us this morning that our hope is not what in is not in what we think should happen. But Lord, our hope should be in what it is you will to happen. Lord, your ways, we don't understand. And sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes it's maddening. Sometimes it's terrifying. But Lord, through it all, even in our frustration and our hurt and our anger and our questioning, would you bring us back to the place of praise? Would you bring us back to a place where we can look up instead of looking back, where we can look forward at what you have coming instead of what we've gone through? Because what's ahead, Lord, is hope. Lord, help us be people of hope. In the midst of all that we've gone through, help us be people of hope. Meet us here as we continue to worship in your name.